。立法會主席。The President。
Cha Xuân, Đại học. Questions. Question one, Dr. Zhang Tong Tai. Good morning. This is Remembrance Day. With uh, Hong Kong's economy and people's livelihood being hit, hit by the epidemic, the non-seasonally adjusted numbers of unemployed and underemployed persons in June to August this year have risen to around 250,000 and around 150,000 respectively. In this connection, will the government inform this council one of the respective numbers of persons whose employment status changed from employed to employed and underemployed during the period from January to October this year, together with the breakdown by the trade in the income group and the age group to which they belonged and by their education level. Two, whether it has studied if Hong Kong will face a serious social problem of persistently high unemployment rate and whether it has formulated measures to prevent and respond to the problem. And three, as it has been reported that some advanced countries in Europe and the United States have been actively studying the implementation of a universal basic income policy under which the government distributes monthly a fixed amount of money to all citizens without putting in place an asset or income test, whether the government will study the implementation of such policy. Secretary for Labour and Welfare. President, having consulted the relevant bureau and departments, my reply to the members' questions is as set up below one. Based on data obtained from the General Household Survey conducted by the Census and Statistics Department, the number of unemployed persons and underemployed persons by industry, age and educational attainment from the first quarter to the third quarter of 2020 are set out in Annex. The survey does not collect information on the previous employment earnings of unemployed and unemployed persons. Two, in the wake of the tremendous challenge brought about by the 2019 coronavirus disease, COVID-19 pandemic to Hong Kong's employment condition and overall economy, the government has implemented a host of measures to create and stabilize employment and strive to provide appropriate assistance to affected persons. The government has earmarked $6 billion under the Anti-Epidemic Fund to take forward the Job Creation Scheme, which is expected to create 30,000 time-limited jobs in the public and private sectors in the coming two years for people of different skill sets and academic qualifications to relieve the unemployment situation. As at end of October 2020, around 29,000 jobs have been created under the scheme and the remaining 1,000 jobs will be put forward soon. Separately, the Labour Department LD has, um, starting from September 2020, raised the ceiling of on-the-job training OJT allowance payable to employers under the Employment Programme for the Elderly and Middle Age, the Youth Employment and Training Programme and the Work Orientation and Placement Scheme with a view to further encouraging employers to hire the elderly and middle aged young people and persons with disabilities and provide them with OJT. LD also launched a pilot scheme concurrently to encourage eligible elderly persons, young people and, and persons with disabilities to participate in and complete OJT under the above employment program through the provision of a retention, retention allowance, thereby stabilizing employment. The Employees Retraining Board, ERB, attracted more than 100,000 trainees annually to enroll in its training courses in the past three years. To support the unemployed or underemployed affected by the economic downturn for skills enhancement, the government has commissioned ERB to launch the Love Upgrading Special Scheme, the special scheme in October 2019, offering three training courses of around two to three months for trainees. The government has assisted ERB in raising the maximum amount of the monthly allowance per trainee from $4,000 to $5,800 starting from May 2020 and tasked it to launch phase two of the special scheme and introduce a series of enhancements in July 2020 including increasing the number of training courses to about 300, as well as supporting enterprises and trade associations in arranging their employees or staff of co member companies who are underemployed or taking no pay leave to attend courses under the special scheme, etc. When necessary, the government may ex consider further extending the special scheme. Further, more, the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance CSSA scheme has been serving as a safety net for those who cannot support themselves financially to need, meet their basic needs. This important function is particularly visible during economic downturns. The CSSA scheme also provides employment support services for able-bodied persons. The chief executive has announced a series of improvement measures on the CSSA scheme in the 2019 policy address with particular focus on enhancing the employment support services. Apart from increasing the relevance special allowance, the collaboration among the service providing organizations, LD and ERB, is also enhanced to provide more vocational training and employment choices to suitable recipients. 
Meanwhile, having regard to the present severe employment situation, the government has, after securing funding approval from the Finance Committee FC of the Legislative Council on the anti-epidemic measures in April 2020, launched a six-month special scheme of assistance to the unemployed under the CSSA framework. According to the arrangements under this time-limited special scheme, the asset limits for able persons per- uh, able-bodied persons have been temporarily relaxed by 100% for six months starting from the 1st of June 2020. The value of their family's owner-occupied residential property will also be disregarded for a grace period of 12 months according to the established mechanism. The government subsequently obtained approval from FC to extend the special scheme for another six months to the 31st of May 2021. In fact, there has been a significant increase in CSSA and employment cases starting from the beginning of this year, with an average of 16,864 cases per month from January to September 2020, which was 43% higher than the average of the same period in 2019. The number of CSSA and employment cases in September 2020 was 19,024, which was the highest in the past six years. The above shows that CSSA is useful in assisting the the unemployed who are facing temporary financial hardship. The government will monitor the situation closely and will consider providing further assistance to persons in need in a timely manner. Three, while some overseas jurisdictions such as Switzerland and Finland have had looked at have looked into the initiative of uh, universal basic income. Given the vast differences in the socioeconomic, public finance and tax systems between these places and the Hong Kong's special administrative region, the experience gained by this region may not be applicable to Hong Kong. The overall policy direction of the Hong Kong SL government is to encourage and support people capable of working to achieve self-reliance through employment while striving to maintain a reasonable and sustainable social welfare system to provide appropriate assistance to persons in need. Promising on this, the government has not considered implementing the universal basic income in Hong Kong nor conduct any relevant studies on it. Dr. Chen Chung Tai. Now, in the administration's reply to part one of my question, that is uh, the statistics on unemployed and unemployed persons, you can see the biggest problem with uh, these statistics that they have totally disregarded guarded the freelancers and the self-employed. I'm talking about, um, you know, people in sports, uh, arts, uh, music, dancing, and uh, filmmaking, uh, and who, whatever. You know, we are talking about um, all these uh, people in creative and cultural industries. Now, the uh, government would only group them as a public administration, social and personal services, or other industries. So my question is, uh, does the government know that there are more and more freelancers in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong contributing to our society? Are there any policies to help them? Uh, you, you shouldn't be stifling this kind of uh, culture of the new generation in Hong Kong. Secretary. Now, the uh, information of the Census Statistics Department covers the employed, uh, employers, and the self-employed. So all the figures are actually reflected here. Now, we know that uh, in Hong Kong around the world, uh, we're fully aware of the, the v- trend uh, of development among tra- freelancers. The government uh, um, you know, uh, takes that very seriously, and we will be exploring po- um, various aspects of support to this group of employees. Mr. Vincent Zhang. S- um, Secretary, anything else from you? Under the current system, if uh, there is uh, uh, anyone with uh, financial needs, uh, that we have a social welfare system to support them. Now, I mentioned the various types of uh, training. Uh, I did mention the freelancers and the self-employed. Actually, they could join these schemes too, Mr. Vincent Zhang. Thank you, President. Well, there is a high unemployment rate, oh, close to 260,000 people are jobless, and many uh, major corporations are um, you know, suspending jobs. And then we've asked for um, unemployment relief. Your government won't do it, but you're not doing enough uh, publicity on these various schemes. The employment support scheme is coming to an end this month. So you, what do you expect uh, to be the um, layoff trend? Will it be serious? And what do you plan to do about it? Secretary. Now, for an employment rate or the number of employed and so on, the government does not uh, have any detailed projection. But of course, uh, 
we are fully aware of the various problems in the uh, economy. So I think the most important thing is to uh, reboot the economy so that we could improve the unemployment, uh, the employment situation. Mr. Ms. Arely, um, President, I agree with the Secretary. The most important thing is for us to revive the economy. To do that, you know, in the U.S. Uh, and, the, and Europe, we can't really rely on that because their situation is worse than ours. So if we want to revive the economy, then we need to have an orderly and healthy resumption of uh, cross-boundary movement. So it's important that we have the health coaching, but because we still do not have uh, zero cases uh, for a, a streak, so uh, the borders cannot be op reopened. So there's no hope really for the economy to be revived. So, so we'll only be seeing more jobless people. Now, for different groups, uh, you have certain policies, but for graduates, it seems that uh, you do not uh, really have um, specific measures for them because when people graduate, they actually just become jobless. So are you going to have any internship schemes uh, in collaboration with businesses so these uh, graduates won't become jobless? Or can you find them job positions in the Greater Bay Area so they could learn more about the developments on the mainland? Secretary. In Table 3, and in the annex to the reply, you will see that uh, in the third quarter, um, the um, increase in un unemployed persons mostly are graduates, you know, post-secondary, um, diploma, certificate graduates, degree graduates, and so on. So th this is a trend is rather obvious. So um, we want to see how we could uh, help um, current graduates or graduates uh, in the coming year. We'll see how we can help them join the uh, job market. We will explore various measures, and there are suitable measures. We will announce them in a timely manner. Dr. Fernando Joe. President. I believe the unemployment situation will continue, unfortunately. Cathay Pacific has just um, sacked uh, over 5,000 people and they have unilaterally altered the contract terms. I believe that's going to happen with other corporations. But then the government would not launch the unemployment relief fund. And I think that's already a consensus of the council. The government wants to uh, unemployed persons to drop below the uh, level of CSSA for a free third person household. You are being generous. You have um, you relaxed the uh, means, the asset limit, um, and you know to one hundred thirty thousand for free person household or one hundred seventy thousand for four person household. So you want um, mid the middle class to uh, f have their assets fall below the um, CSSA line before you would give them help. So, Secretary, when would you actually consider the Unemployment Relief or Assistance Fund? Now, maybe you could uh, exempt uh, the uh, working hours, uh, so, you, so you will take this special measure at this special time to help this group of unemployed persons. Secretary, well, in the past six months or so, we've been uh, discussing this issue continuously. The you know, for, for the unemployed, we have existing mechanisms and we have uh, unemployment uh, mechanisms to try to help them. We have never stopped exploring all the possibilities when there could be any improvement measures or new schemes uh, uh, that are suitable, then we will certainly consult the council. Which part of the question has not been answered? You know, for uh, working family living allowance, when would you exempt the uh, working hours um, limit? So uh, for those who are unemployed, they will get some temporary relief. Secretary, for the working family living allowance is uh, for people who are working. For those who are not working, then there are other social security measures to help them. Mr. Kenneth Lau. Thank you, President. Unemployment rate 6.4% is the highest in 16 years. The uh, government has uh, re said repeatedly that it would not uh, launch an unemployment relief uh, fund. So, but I don't see there are other measures to help them, though. We could expect the unemployment situation to worsen further, and uh, the unemployment rate will remain at a high level. So in the coming policy address, will there be new measures to help uh, the, the unemployed? Secretary. If uh, the member is asking me about the content of policy address, I'm afraid you have to wait till the 25th of November, which is the tentative date for the delivery of the policy address. Thank you. Mr. Michael, look. 
the unemployment scheme is coming to an end in December, uh, we could expect a surge in unemployment rate, although we wouldn't want to see that. Now, Dr. Lo Chi Kuang would not agree to launch the unemployment assistance. Uh, we propose nine thousand dollars per month. Uh, we have an say if we have a uh, three hundred thousand people unemployed, so for six months it's only fifteen plus a billion dollars. The unemployment, uh, the employment support scheme costs uh, eighty billion dollars. And um, you know, this is something that the unemployment assistance is something that you know, uh, you know innovative. You can do it. Um, you know, uh, the uh, in the the, the um, an innovation office is able to launch a new measure in just two to three months. Are you you not as efficient as that office? Can you not uh, just um, provide this assistance for a few months on a temporary basis because people are in dire straits? Do you have any new ideas? Don't don't please don't keep harping the same chord. Mm. Now uh, we've answered. I've answered the questions uh, repeatedly. As I said, we are very much concerned about the employment situation. And as I said in the reply, what is important is uh, to consider measures to revive the economy. As for help for the unemployed, we will keep exploring possibilities. Mr. Pun Xiuping. Well, we, I think we can expect the unemployment to keep uh, climbing. And there are no new measures coming from the government. Now, as at September 2020, there are 19,000 CSSA cases, uh, high in six years. And you say the government will um, keep monitoring the situation and will consider giving uh, uh, further assistance to persons in need in a timely manner. But then there are many uh, people who are on no pay leave, they get no assistance, uh, they used to earn $30,000, they're only earning $10,000 now, so they fall them below the CSSA line. It's tough for them. So you say you will consider further assistance to persons in need in a timely manner, but under what circumstances will you be providing this addition, further assistance? And what is the arrangement? Secretary, well, as I said in my earlier reply, we are fully aware of the concerns of the public and the electrical members. We will respond to these concerns and we will explore the various uh, issues. And when uh, we have um, formulated any measures, definitely we will consult the council. Mr. Roy Kwong. As long as I'm a LESCO member, I will ask for the uh, Carrie Lam's government to return ten thousand dollars to the pub, uh, to each uh, in the community because the uh, people are really suffering, and I think it is only fair and right that the government gives our cash to everybody. Now, Secretary for Labor and Welfare. You know, there is a cross-party consensus, that is, we want uh, the government to uh, give cash back to the public. So you should pass on the views to the, the Carrie Lam, and for the policy address on the 25th of November, you should um, you, uh, tell the C to do so. And then yesterday we had a discussion on um, the, the electricity tariff increase, and the two power companies wouldn't agree not to increase the tariff. So have you asked uh, uh, passed on our views, uh, that, which is a cross-party consensus of this council, for $10,000 to be given to the public. Uh, have you passed it on to the uh, CE? Secretary, if there is this consensus, I'm sure the chief executive need, will know about it. I don't need to pass on that demand. Mr. Jeremy Tam. Well, we're seeing a surge in uh, unemployment rate. In your table, uh, there are figures for quarter three. I believe that doesn't include the uh, number of staff members laid off by the Cathay Pacific. So how are you going to uh, uh, offer um, uh, job security to people? You know, uh, for pe staff laid off uh, by Cathay Pacific, um, about 600 are pilots. Half of them are expatriates, half of them are about Hong Kong residents. And so for the expatriates, they are in Hong Kong here on a work visa. So the uh, immigration department or the labor department will usually tell them there are certain jobs uh, uh, in Hong Kong where we do not have enough talents locally. That's why work visa could be issued to expatriates to come to Hong Kong to take up such um, specialized jobs. Now for pilots, uh, you know, you would allow Cathay Pacific to apply for as many overseas pilots as possible. Uh, as they wish, rather. And then here we're talking about a few hundred pilots 
who are qualified and who are Hong Kong residents holding Hong Kong identity cards. Now, I'm, I'm stressed that I'm not, you know, um, discriminating on the grounds of race. But I'm just saying, uh, um, can you make sure that the Labour Department will not uh, indiscriminately issue work visas to uh, overseas nationals on the basis of uh, local talent pool here? Now, Secretary, of course, uh, we will, um, uh, when we carry out such tasks, uh, the Labour Department will um, consult the Immigration Department before issuing work visas. Which part of your question has not been answered? I asked him, for this particular job type, would you cons make a, give it special consideration? It's not that uh, uh, you will just uh, continue to discuss the matter, Secretary. Now, there are different job types, and that includes the job type mentioned by the member. Dr. Elizabeth Court. Now, Secretary, how are you doing to monitor the situation closely and consider further assistance to persons in need in a timely manner? What is uh, timely? Many people are already jobless. In January, at the start of the epidemic, the DAB told, asked the government to provide this unemployment assistance. This is what the public needs. And you said at the time you didn't have the system, so you couldn't do it. But it's already November. If you started to consider at the, that at the time, probably you could have, be, have done it by now. But uh, it seems that you just you just don't want to help the unemployed. And then, uh, well, okay, and then the government said you wouldn't do the unemployment uh, as, as assistance. And what about allowing the public to withdraw from their MPF account to tie over the tough times? And then you said you wouldn't consider it. Now people are in dying straight and you still saying you will monitor the situation closely. So how closely will you monitor the situation? Because it's really bad already. And uh, how, how timely you know, can you launch measures? What measures are you launching? What if uh, unemployment rate surges further next month? What uh, uh, further assistance could you provide to those in need in a timely manner? Secretary. Well, what I'm saying that, uh, please don't get me wrong, I'm saying that uh, we will explore various measures and if we have certain ideas, then we will t consult members in a timely manner. Thank you. Question to Honourable Yukinian. President, the Education Bureau EDB cancelled the registration of a primary school teacher and issued reprimand letters or warning letters to the principal, vice principal, and relevant teachers of the school in which that teacher worked. Quite a number of the members of the public have queried such a move by EDB carried a political purpose. Also, some members of the public and bodies of the education sector have criticized the complaint handling mechanism as tantamount to a black box operation. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, regarding the following two time periods, i.e. from January 2015 to May 2019, and from June 2019, when the movement of opposition to proposed legislative amendments started to the present, the respective number of cases in which the school is concerned after investigating into the complaints against the teachers had concluded that it was unnecessary to take disciplinary actions, but EDB subsequently took disciplinary actions against the teacher concerned. Two, who first devised the mechanism currently in use for handling the mechanism against teachers. Please enclose the relevant documents of the reasons why, and this mechanism not until the appeals board stage is the complaining given an opportunity to attend a hearing and make an oral representation. How do EDB ensure that under such circumstances the complaining is treated fairly and impartially before his or her teacher registration is cancelled? And three, given that the principal, vice principal, and relevant teachers of the primary school concerned have also been disciplined, whether such practice of collective punishment is applicable to for all type of cases, if not, of the circumstances under which the school management and other teachers will be implicated. Education for Secretary. President, teachers play a vital role in passing on knowledge and nurturing student character. Their words and deeds should meet the professional conduct required of them and the expectations of society. According to the Education Ordinance, the Education Bureau EDB is the authority for registration of teachers. Hence, the responsibility to ensure the quality of teachers. The EDB may, may cancel registration of a teacher in accordance with the Education Ordinance if he or she is not a fit or proper person or is incompetent to be a teacher, so as to safeguard the well-being of students, uphold the professional student of teachers, and maintain public confidence in education in Hong Kong. 
in September this year, the EDB cancelled the registration of a teacher for the serious professional misconduct of disseminating the message of Hong Kong independence in class. I wish to stress that the EDB decision was based on concrete evidence and the action taken was in accordance with the law. We we'll explained the matter to the public on various occasions and we're not going to repeat them here. While it's appreciated that society had different views on the matter, we deeply regret that there is an organization which is not has not considered the matter from the perspective of the education profession and the well-being of the students, but has also kept politicizing the issue. There are more citizens and organizations in support of this bureau to strictly enforce the law for upholding the professionalism of teachers and safeguard the well-being of students. We will definitely continue to act in accordance with the law. I will reply to the question raised by Honorable Yip Kinyut as as follows. 1. Uh, schools as employees of teachers have the responsibility to supervise the teachers, which include handling complaints against them. If the teacher is found to have committed an act of professional misconduct or misbehaved, schools should, in implies with the education ordinance, the code of aid, and the terms of employment contracts signed with the teacher's concern, take appropriate follow-up actions according to school-based mechanism. The ADB responsible for the registration of teachers. If a teacher is found to have committed an act of professional misconduct or misbehave, we have the responsibility to take appropriate action according to the law to safeguard student well-being, uphold the dignity of the teaching profession, and maintain the public confidence in the teaching profession. It also does justice to all the teachers who are professional and dedicated. When considering the follow-up action to be taken, the ADB will focus on whether the act in question conform to the professional conduct required of the teacher, uh, whether the teacher concerned has fallen short of the society expectations, and whether the values so demonstrated will have an adverse impact on the education profession or students. We will also fully consider all the information collected for and all the relevant factors, including the school report, the representation of the teachers, the existing legislation, the EDB guidelines, as well as the vision, goals, and aims of the curriculum. To review the whether the learning student is promoted in a proper manner in accordance with the education ordinance by the school and teacher concerned. The ADB, in light of severity of the incident, take appropriate actions such as issuing advisory, warning, or reprimand letter to the teacher's concern, or may even cancel his or her teacher's registration. Given that the ADB and schools have different responsibilities and their considerations might not be the same, the follow actions taken by the two parties cannot be compared directly. As a matter of fact, we often receive complaints and query individual school management of the teachers, and quite a number of these cases were referred by the teachers' union, in which the Honorable Yip Kin Yun played a leading role, requesting the EDB to take public action. I trust the general public will not accept it if the EDB only considered the school reports without conducting an invest independent investigation. It is not rare that the EDB does not fully agree with the views of the school management. As such, the EDB considers it unnecessary to compile, and it has not compiled the statistics on such situations. The EDB has a clear mechanism with well-defined procedures for handling cases of suspected professional misconduct, which we have elucidated through different channels. I say in my reply to a written question raised by Honorable Yip two weeks ago, 28th of October, and enforcing the provisions regarding refusing or cancelling registration under the Education Ordinance, the Permanent Secretary of Education has set up an internal task force comprising of the EDB directed officers to review all cases in which they involve the registration of teachers starting from 2003. In just the internal task force of EDB reviewed all cases that may involve teacher registration. Upon receiving a complaint against the teachers, the EDB will request the school to conduct an investigation. The school will normally inform the teachers concerned about the complaint and let him or her give explanation. The school will also meet with other people concerned, such as other teachers and students, and as necessary, and then submit a report to EDB. Upon receipt of the school report, will examine its content carefully and request the school to submit supplementary information as appropriate. For cases that are likely to be substantiated in the EDB's initial view, will inform the teacher concerned of our view and invite him or her to submit written representations within reasonable time. For cases that may involve cancellation, we will inform the teacher concerned of possible cancellation and invite him or her to submit representation within 14 days with full understanding of the severity of the case. During the process, the EDB will fully consider all the concrete evidence collected and analyzed thoroughly from a professional perspective at different channels. The teacher concern has full and fair responsibilities, opportunities for making representations and self-defense, including submission or representation with knowledge of possible cancellation, and ensure the teacher concern is treated fairly and impartially. Should the teachers be not satisfied with the decision of the cancellation of his or her registration, he or she may appeal to the appeals board panel within 21 days. The Education Commission set up the Working Group on Promoting and Upholding Teachers' Professional Conduct in 2013 to conduct a review on EDB investigation mechanisms for handling cases of misconduct involving educators. In its review report issued in 2015, 
the working group affirmed that the existing mechanism has been operating effectively and satisfied with the mechanism under which the EDB is playing the monitoring role. 3. Teachers and schools should perform their respective roles and strive to provide quality education for students. The school management has the responsibility to supervise the conduct of teachers and monitor the content of school-based curriculum and ensure it's in compliance with the curriculum guide, helping students to acquire correct knowledge and concept and help them to develop positive values and attitudes. Teachers with their professional knowledge and judgment should achieve these goals through custom teaching. In the present case, information showed that the management failed to effectively monitor the content of the school-based curriculum, including allowing the dissemination of the messages of Hong Kong independence in class, and thus be held responsible for that dereliction of duty. As for other teachers teaching the topic, they should exercise their professional judgment and report to the judgment when they found problems with the lesson plan, teachers, and worksheet so that remedial action could be taken. However, teachers could not take any professional fault action, hence should also be held account responsible. In short, the principal, vice principal, and other teachers involved in the case should be respectfully held responsible. The term collective punishment or implication is severely misleading and incorrect. Mr. Yip. President. This reply is a huge letdown. It failed to apply anything. No figures or information as requested. A rather hollow reply. And on the issue of collective punishment or implication, I would like to follow up. The secretary denied that this is any collective punishment or implication. As we know, such fact just have been described at tyranny back in Qing Dynasty. It shouldn't happen in a modern society. In the Secretary's main reply, he stated that it isn't either way, but he explained that the other teachers concerned should also exercise professional judgment. If they found that the lesson plan teach materials and worksheet is problematic, they should raise it to the management and take remedial action. However, there's no professional follow-up to be held accountable. Found that they haven't found all they need to uh, be uh, to discover that or fail to report that we need to be held accountable for our colleagues' action. If this isn't collective punishment, then what is? If this is implications, so what is this? In a modern society, under what circumstances will we resort to this kind of disciplinary action? President, that would uh, snare a lot of innocent people in taking responsibility. Well, Secretary, if EDB managed its manpower internally, and, and how many of them would need to be disciplined due to the action of the, the colleagues of uh, yourself? have been disciplined due to lack of supervision. Secretary, I'm also very disappointed with Mr. Yip's question, and I state clearly that the teachers in question are not any random teachers. The teachers are responsible to teaching that subject when they received a a possible case, how could not speak out as professional teachers? When they spot a problem with their teaching materials, should they keep silent? If Mr. Yip sees that what a professional teacher ought to do, it seems that our standards are fall apart. Your standards are just too low. As professional teachers, when they spot a problem with the teaching materials, they should take it up with the management. They should tell the management that there's a problem with it, in which we to take remedial action. So how can you link it to Qin Dynasty collective punishment? It was known that um, back then, uh, for one buddy who break the law, the whole family would get in trouble. We're talking about that when, for a teacher, when receiving a th problematic teaching materials, he didn't say anything. And Mr. Yip didn't see that as a problem and claimed we shouldn't be held accountable for other people's action. Of course, it's not being uh, accountable for other people's action, that he's being accountable for not speaking up. Well, as the Secretary of Education, the, well, uh, uh, the, the, I have been held accountable on many occasions. Well, can you describe the implication? It's because uh, there's uh, some uh, 
implementation flaws on my subordinates. I don't see that that would be what expect of a public appointed official. I need to be held responsible for what happened in EDB. This is not collective punishment or implication. It's just being responsible. Ms. Claudia Mo, which part of the question not answered? Uh, uh, how many uh, staff in EDB have been subject to such kind of uh, treatment? You already raised your question. Please sit down. Secretary, any addition? Uh, President, I'm not sure what Mr. Yip is asking. We work as a team at the EDB that we are very cohesive. I believe the education sector is also very cohesive. We just uh, we're not um, blaming each other. We just try to make things better. So I'm not able to answer his question, Miss Claudia Mo. Bad guilty by association. Now there's a famous saying by Dr. Johnson: patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. And they are now using patriotism as a professional requirement for teachers. Of course, you're still awaiting official definition of patriotism from Beijing over how to kowtow even more properly. My question is, how do you uh, decide that uh, a teacher is unpatriotic and that means simply uh, he's uh, unethical and then you can take action because our school management is supposed to be school-based when it uh, suits you, <laughs> obviously, when you can share the responsibility. But when it doesn't, it becomes political persecution, isn't it? Isn't that all correct? When deal with all kind of complaints, we just act on facts. We really look at the action and compliance with the law and also meeting the society's standards and also the way negative impact to students before we take action. And so whether it's patriotic or not, and every Chinese, uh, every Chinese in Hong Kong should love our country. And also be responsible to our country. That's also required of all the electrical members. Our society expectation of our teachers to love our country. I found it perfectly sensible. I'm not sure what's wrong with it. Mr. Ted Hoy. Thank you, Member Le. Well, there's a lot of taboo topics in school nowadays. For example, democratic elections, uh, criticizing the government, police violence, the anti extradition uh, movement, and also uh, civic disobedience. There's all taboo. If you touched on them, that you'll have the registration canceled. Our education sector has sunk so low mm -hmm. that due to a teacher political stand to decide to silence them. Well, a question. Can we teach a student uh, what a conscience, black and white, or moral courage, or could only able to teach students on obedience, or slaving as a slave to the uh, regime at schools? Secretary, I'm not sure why the uh, Mr. Ted Hui uh, get the illusion that these all can be taught in schools. I wonder what kind of evidence we have. If we can discuss it, we can provide evidence. If just purely speculation, I can't discuss on them. I can inform the public that in campus, discussing the uh, uh, go governance is perfectly all right. Uh, discussing mm. the so recent social incidents are perfectly okay. Uh, student have any queries on the teachers? The teachers and provide answers for them. As for the slaves of the regime, I believe that no one in Hong Kong would willing to serve as a slave to the regime. Thus, I found Mr. Hui's question a uh, uh, pure speculation. I'm not able to supply an answer to him. 
of his liking. Well, very short, direct question. Can teachers can discuss police violence and anti-Asian movement at schools? That's not your previous question. Let's sit down. Mr. Michael Tien, I want to look at this case from the institution and education point of view. They reported that the teacher itself uh, was a PE teacher who had not been teaching the live edu uh, education subject. However, is well familiar with the current events of invited to draft the materials. Uh, I also um, touched on Tibetan independence and Brexit and Taiwan independence. May I ask uh, uh, who can education have no regulation who can draft the materials? Is uh, that uh, anything goes in the primary school campus regardless of the a difficulty. Uh, well, talk about Brexit to primary school, dude. Would have found that funny? I see there's a serious flawed education. The government had a duty and need to have a clear position. Well, what are the uh, have any regulation on the primary school curriculum? Secretary, in the Hong Kong curriculum, we have this curriculum structure in place for local school curriculum. For example, a uh, lower primary. Uh, high pr uh, primary and um, lower secondary and high secondary, and on the uh, learning uh, uh, and areas and stuff had all well prescribed. The school should follow the curriculum guide in producing their own school based materials and learning. That's ex ex uh, uh, all right. However, they should really stick to the curriculum guide as a whole for the mechanism. The school had the first hand duty uh, to supervise that school based materials are comply with the objectives and goals. And uh, age appropriate. When the students are too young, if you're teaching them something too difficult and beyond their ability to understand or discuss or to learn, that that was that is quite wrong. In such case, what how do we supervise? The EDB would have colleagues or uh, to do, um uh, observations. The school have the first hand duty for each piece of school based material. The duty the school need to ensure they will comply with the school as education perspective, and we'll conduct sampling checks as well. And we also organize uh, courses to help the schools and the teachers to uh, produce such school based materials, well, as to really to facilitate effective learning in students. Mr. Horace Cheng, uh, we haven't quite answered me. Well, the ADB th think that uh, teaching political events in the uh, Occupy Central or uh, Brexit. At school, what's your position? It's primary school. You already raised your question. Anything to West Secretary? I think we need to look at the uh, materials as opposed to just the topic. For the topic you mentioned, well, for the lower primary school, that would be quite difficult for them. For higher primary students, well, without going too much detail and just describe the itself, mm -hmm. I won't rule that out. I uh, probably uh, can possibly say whether we can men, uh, be teach a uh, topic or not. It's just how do we teach, and also the uh, lesson plan and so on. Well, I think it's okay to mention Brexit to the higher primary school as for uh, widening to Brexit and what procedures gone through, and also different political system, which are difficult beyond them. Thus, we need to look at the lesson plan and how in depth, and also what is the objective before deciding this appropriate. So that's a profession discussion, as as opposed to being clearly cut. Uh, uh, cut. You're ready to raise your follow-up question. You can raise them another occasion, Mr. Horace Chung. Mr. Chen, please sit down. Mr. Horace Chung, well, the education have given pretty great, good performance in rebutting distorted facts. It's reported that. The teaching material in question have been um, publicized. You can see that the contents it hugely problematic, and they were very detrimental to our primary students. Well, President, even though the problem is clear cut, as we see 
from Mr. Yip of the Professional Teachers Union, they are evading the crux of the matter, that uh, uh, spreading Hong Kong independence ideas is unacceptable. They are keep uh, shielding the teacher in question and focus instead on procedurals. For example, the complainee uh, have yet to get the chance of our representation. Please raise your question. And also that our teaching material fall within academic autonomy. And some said that they would have a chance to make all representations not unfair to them. And some claim that academic freedom is an MLA, thus you should not interfere. Secretary, and how would you respond to this um, distort fellow ideas? As our main reply was in early occasions, we have given uh, two opportunities for written representation and coming up uh, he will launch an appeal with the appeals board by then uh, there will be a chance for oral representation so uh, in the mechanism there will be adequate opportunities for them uh, to uh, give this account and the Prime Secretary had duly considered their written representations. As for academic freedom, well, for a primary school curriculum, the focus on how do we teach the student, we should put students first and their life, their welfare first. Academic freedom is a huge uh, concept in helping to enhance our education quality and at the end of the day is really for the benefit of students and for this episode we'll talk about a, a matter of teacher professionalism and the impact of student and not a question of economic freedom yeah question three Do dr honorable lawyer cock what is the point of order uh mr yip kin yun um just now um uh Member Chen Kokon had made an allegation. I want him to withdraw what he just said. Please sit down. Dr. Boloi Kok. President, last month the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development indicated that in order to facilitate the movement of people between Hong Kong and other parts of the world, the government was studying the introduction of a rapid nucleic acid test for COVID-19 at the airport. In this connection, will the government inform this council first of the details of the relevant study, including the progress made so far and the implementation table, whether it will study the provision of rapid test services at all boundary control points, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Second. As the World Health Organization, the WHO, announced in September this year that affordable antigen rapid test kits, which were to be priced at a maximum of about 40 Hong Kong dollars per unit and could provide results in 15 to 30 minutes, would be made available for low- and middle-income countries. Whether the government has gained an understanding from WHO of the suitability of using such test kits in Hong Kong and discuss with it the procurement arrangements. If so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. And third, whether it will allocate additional resources to promote the collaboration between local universities and research institutions in the research and development of rapid test kits vaccines and drugs for COVID-19? If so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health. President, the government's priority at the moment is to incorporate disease prevention and control and infection management into the new normal of the day-to-day -day operation of society with an aim to minimizing new cases as far as possible. Adhering to the principle of preventing the importation of cases and the spreading of the virus in the community, on one hand, we have strictly implemented epidemic control measures at various boundary control points, including testing and quarantine for inbound travelers to suppress any chance that the virus may enter the community. On the other hand, we have continued to implement various prevention and control measures, including monitoring and surveillance, targeted group testing, social distancing measures, etc., in accordance with the principle of early identification, early isolation, and early treatment of the infected to prevent the spread of the virus in the community. The government has been implementing suitable cross-boundary control measures having regard to the epidemic situation to prevent importation of COVID-19 cases. 
Although we have now restricted the entry of foreigners who are non-Hong Kong residents, there are still local residents who continue to return to Hong Kong from abroad. And quite a number of them are returning from places with severe epidemic situations. The continued risk of importation of the virus and infected patients has created considerable strain on disease prevention and control in Hong Kong. As the epidemic is still rampant across the globe, Hong Kong will need to continue to strictly implement entry, testing and quarantine arrangements for some time. At the same time, we must allow limited cross-boundary people flow having regard to actual needs with the implementation of risk control measures. In consultation with the Innovation and Technology Bureau, my reply to the various parts of the question raised by Honorable Lloyd Kwok is as follows. First, at present, all persons arriving at the Hong Kong International Airport are required to undertake testing for COVID-19. Currently, the arrival testing is based on a nucleic acid test using the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR technique, which normally takes a few hours. With the exception of a few exempted persons, such as government officials and consular corps, the majority of persons entering Hong Kong must wait for the test results before leaving the airport which is the test and hold arrangement, as it is necessary to continue the arrival testing arrangement to prevent the importation of virus and with an increase in the number of travelers who need to undertake testing under various entry facilitating measures such as travel bubbles, the government has been closely monitoring the development of various COVID-19 testing technologies. The goal is to adopt faster and reliable testing technologies where appropriate in order to ensure prevention of importation of cases with controllable risks while facilitating travelers as far as practicable. After a preliminary assessment conducted by the Department of Health on October 28th, a trial run of a nucleic acid test using reverse transcription loop mediated isothermal amplification RT lamp technique began at the Hong Kong International Airport. The trial run was conducted in parallel with the RT PCR nucleic acid test, which is the highest standard currently used by DH to examine the sensitivity and reliability of the RT lamp technique. During the trial, passengers were still required to wait for a negative RT PCR test result before proceeding to quarantine. The trial run was expected to last for two weeks and may be extended subject to the amount of data gathered during the trial period. We will study the data collected from the trial and assess the efficacy of the testing technique and the feasibility for applying it to different uses including testing for arriving passengers. As regards the identification of rapid test technologies, the government and the airport authority Hong Kong are open to any testing technologies that have the potential in achieving a level of sensitivity and specificity suitable for boundary screening purposes. Second, on nucleic acid tests, Laboratories in Hong Kong are using the nucleic acid test, which is adopted as the reference method. Although the WHO considered that antigen tests could expand the scope of testing, particularly in countries that do not have extensive laboratory facilities or trained health workers to implement molecular, which is polymerase chain reaction tests, the WHO guidance published on September 11th reiterated that antigen tests are only valuable in areas where community transmission is widespread and where nucleic acid testing is either unavailable or where test results are significantly delayed. The government will closely monitor the latest development of the technology concerned. In order to combat the epidemic since April 2020, the Health and Medical Research Fund, HMRF, administered by the Food and Health Bureau, has approved a total funding of $47 million to support four local universities to conduct 11 studies relating to the testing methods, vaccines, and antivirals of COVID-19. 
the HMRF will suitably allocate additional resources to support research in these areas in order to complement the government's work in combating the epidemic. On the other hand, through the Innovation and Technology Fund ITF, the Innovation and Technology Commission ITC has provided funding support for local research and development centers, universities, other designated local public research institutes, and private companies to conduct R&D projects. From 2017-18 to 2019-20, the ITF has funded 35 public health-related R&D projects involving funding of about $75.4 million. Besides, the ITC launched a special call for projects under the Public Sector Trial Scheme in March this year to support product development and application of technologies for the prevention and control of the epidemic. And the ITF in August this year also supported in principle a COVID-19 related project on the development of technology for vaccine production. Thank you, President. Dr. Lowell Kwok. President. The government uh, set up uh, four permanent co uh, community testing centers, and it will cost $240 per test, which will be in commission starting the middle of this month. Many residents hope that a negative test result will be used for cross-boundary purposes for the health code. The results must be uh, rapid to ensure that the residents will be able to enjoy the service. A rapid test, uh, are the rapid tests going to be provided in these four community testing centers? Secretary. President, the rapid tests are now being used at the international airport, which is to be used with RT-PCR technique test. Uh, we are now conducting a trial scheme, and we're going to compare these two technologies to examine the sensitivity and reliability of the technique. The RT-PCR is of the highest standard um, in the world. Um, Hong Kong in both the public and private sector are using the highest standard RT-PCR techniques. Uh, before we gather all the data um, and, and the sensitivity and reliability of the new trial test, we're still going to continue to use the RT-PCR nucleic acid test in our four community testing centers. Mr. Christopher Chung. President. I think in combating the COVID-19, the government has been slow in response. And um, many policies have not been launched. Um, the public has been hoping for a health code, yet we still do not see any in place. The government still uh, cannot uh, uh, waive the 14-day quarantine for people entering from the mainland. Those Hong Kong residents living in Guangdong Province and Macau will, can only be exempted from quarantine after November 23rd. Well, before the launch of the health code, would the government consider um, going for a unilateral health code? to allow those from the mainland to be exempted from the 14-day quarantine so that um, people from both sides um, will find it more convenient. If not, um, please let us know the details. Secretary, President, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Chang for his question. We would like to resume uh, cross-boundary flow. The government is very concerned about resuming such services as soon as possible. We can see that um, the number of cases have reduced recently. However, the pandemic is still rampant around the world, 
and there are over 50 million cases worldwide. Under this premise, and with um, the new risk of a winter flu, the Food and Health Bureau, from the perspective of public health, must ensure that we control the epidemic, uh, which is to prevent the importation of cases and the spreading of the virus in the community. Earlier on, uh, we held a press briefing together with the CMAB, in which we announced a plan of, uh, of the returning to Hong Kong 2.0 in which after assessing the pandemic in Macau and Kwangtung province, which is very stable, we're going to put these people under the second category of uh, places and countries. And with a negative test result, these people will be exempted from the compulsory 14-day quarantine in Hong Kong. We have already announced earlier that this will begin on November 23rd. In the initial stage, uh, this will be limited to Hong Kong residents returning to Hong Kong, and there will be a quota. Uh, you must uh, reserve the quota online. Uh, we now have two boundary ports. There will be uh, five, five, uh, 5,000 quotas uh, per day. And with a negative test result together with the health code, um, this technology is quite mature for us to carry this out now. Therefore, if we are beginning on November 23rd, uh, you will be able to reserve for such a quarter a week in advance, which is November 18th. Thank you. Call for quorum, please.
。姚思荣议员。Honorable 姚思荣。Thank you, President. Secretary, I hear that there are some tests that would only take an hour for、uh, results. I'm not sure whether you have tried to understand this kind of technology. With such a technology,、uh, you might look into locating premises near the boundary points to convenient、uh, the public who are going across the boundary on a frequent basis. Secretary,、uh, thank you, Mr. Yu, for your question. There are many different types of COVID-19 rapid tests in the market. Our public、uh, sector laboratory currently uses a rapid nucleic acid, a rapid test、uh, that is researched and developed by us. We are continuously improving. The test. We also assess those we find in the market, or those that are being developed by both、uh, local and overseas experts. And we continuously assess、uh, results of different technologies. We would then decide which technology to adopt after. Thorough assessment. Therefore, at the current stage, we do not believe、um, any other test、uh, that is appropriate. We look into the sensitivity and reliability of the technique.、Uh, some tests、uh, may be very rapid. But they may not be reliable enough. We need to、uh, safeguard public health, especially during these times of pandemic. Therefore, we must adopt a prudent approach for those、uh, who would like a more convenient test.、Um, there are actually many different. Places and countries researching into rapid tests, we will continue our monitoring and we adopt a an open approach, open-minded approach.、Uh, starting from end of October, we have already begun examining the RT lamp technique together with our RT PCR test to assess the sensitivity and reliability of these new techniques. Once we have a better understanding of the techniques, we will share updates with everyone. Thank you, Dr. Helena Wong, President. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Yu Si Wing. Which part of the answer did she not answer? Oh, I want to ask、uh, whether you have located any、um, venues、uh, suitable for testing、um, near the cross-boundary locations, Secretary. Uh, there will not be any、um, rapid tests、uh, being conducted near the boundary points. The DH does not believe、um, any other rapid test that reaches our standard. We are now conducting a trial scheme at the airport, and once we have the results, we will then explore this further. Once we understand that it is safe and it's of high sensitivity, and that it can um, plug um, loopholes in other tests,、uh, we will then、uh, adopt other tests. Dr. Helena Wong,、um, President, in part one of the answer, the secretary. Um, said that、um, persons arriving at the airport will need to wait a few hours for results, but this is not what I heard.、Um, it seems you're lying to us, Secretary. For flights arriving around this time,、uh, which is around noon now, they can only、uh, receive their test results tomorrow at the same time. 
That means it takes about 24 hours. So you're trying to mislead us here with your answer. Arrivals in Hong Kong at the airport have to wait a long time. Those who arrived at noon yesterday um, waited until 5 in the afternoon or wait until 5 uh, this morning to um, to get their baggage and then they need to wait another hour and a half before they have transportation to the hotel and then they will have to wait overnight. You tell us that um, this test only takes a few hours, yet in reality it takes about 24 hours. Well, even if you have a test that takes a few hours, all the other procedures are so slow. And there are no announcements in the airport telling Hong Kong arrivals what to do and why they need to wait there. Nobody understands the procedures. Nobody understands what's going on. Have you actually talked to um, arrival, Hong Kong arrivals um, on the procedure? Please sit down and wait for the secretary answer. Um, President, uh, I'm not trying to mislead Lechko. I can try to explain clearly here um, the uh, work at the Hong Kong airport. Earlier on, uh, there was a temporary testing center at the Asia World Expo. And the, the procedure there would take a longer period of time. I am saying that it takes a few hours for the test to arrive at the laboratory and see results. However, when there are many flights arriving Hong Kong at the same time, and uh, we need to uh, test many different specimens, uh, these specimens would then need to be transported to our laboratories for testing. And the results would then be notified to, to arrivals, and that takes a long time. Uh, we have made improvements because we have now uh, moved it to a different location, and we have made improvements to the entire procedure. I was talking about rapid tests here, which uh, we have now launched a pilot scheme at the airport, and the new RT lamp technique compared to the current RT-PCR test we are currently using. As this rapid test um, trial is uh, done by a, a private laboratory, it will take a shorter time, and there is a laboratory in the airport. However, um, our public um, laboratories are not at the airport, and it will take a longer time. Thank you. Question for Mr. Xu Kachun. Thank you, President. Currently, the judiciary maintains a register of sign language interpreters and engages on a freelance basis the interpreters on the register to provide interpretation service in court proceedings for people with hearing or speech impairment. Such service has been subjected to criticism from time to time in recent years. For instance, a sign language interpreter was alleged to have breached the codes of professional conduct by requesting on one's own volition the defendant to plead guilty. A defendant was in need of sign language interpretation service, but such service was not arranged and the court did not permit a sign language interpreter who was not on the register to provide interpretation service for a defendant. In this connection, will the government inform this council if it knows one whether the judiciary has regularly updated the register on sign language interpreters? If the judiciary has, of the details, if not, the reasons for that. Two, whether sign language interpretation service provided on a freelance basis is sufficient to cope with the service demand, and whether the judiciary has plans to engage full time sign language interpreters. If, if the judiciary, if so, the, of the details, if not, the reasons for that. And Three, whether the judiciary has put in place a mechanism for handling complaints about the quality of sign language interpretation service. If the, so, of the details, if not, whether the judiciary will establish such mechanism. Chief Secretary for Administration. 
president. Based on the information provided by the judiciary, the government's consolidated reply is as follows. To facilitate administration of justice, sign language interpretation service is provided to a witness or party who has such a need in any court proceedings or part of any proceedings. For, for this purpose, the Judiciary Administration maintains a list of registered sign language interpreters who may be engaged to provide interpretation services on a freelance basis as and when necessary. These freelance interpreters are not employees of the judiciary. They will provide the necessary services to the courts on a freelance basis for a period of days, such as half a day, in the capacity of a service provider as and when necessary. At present, there are 17 registered sign language interpreters on the judiciary administration's list. Over the past five years, the total number of proceedings requiring sign language interpretation services remained steady at about 100 cases per year on average. That is some eight to nine cases per month at all levels of court. The current pool of registered sign language interpreters is adequate in meeting the service needs. As such, the Judiciary Administration sees no imminent need to enlarge its pool of freelance sign language interpreters at this stage and does not consider it cost-effective to employ any full-time sign language interpreters. Court interpretation is not an easy task as it involves court cases and bears legal consequences. The Judiciary Administration will engage suitably experienced interpreters to provide interpretation services according to the complexities of the court proceedings involved. To ensure the quality of interpretation services in court proceedings, the Judiciary requires that registered sign language interpreters meet certain requirements, including passing the sign language proficiency tests and interviews, and possessing considerable experience in providing court interpretation service, such as the interpreter concerned has the ability and experience to perform sign language interpretation work of different complexities at different levels of courts. Besides, the Judiciary Administration has put in place a performance monitoring mechanism to ensure the quality of service provided by the freelance interpreters to the courts. The judiciary collects feedback and views on the performance of such interpreters from court users and the judiciary's full-time court interpreters and also reviews this mechanism from time to time. Any complaints against the freelance sign language interpreters engaged by the judiciary administration will be dealt with in accordance with the established procedures of the judiciary administration. Specifically, the Judiciary Administration will conduct an investigation upon receipt of the complaint having regard to all relevant facts surrounding the allegations. Where the complaint is found substantiated, appropriate management actions including warning, suspension of service and delisting will be taken. This will also be duly taken into account in engaging the service of the freelance interpreter concerned for court proceedings in future. Over the past five years, one such complaint, which involved the service performance of a freelance sign language interpreter at court, was received. The Judiciary Administration looked into the case in accordance with the established mechanism and found it not substantiated. Apart from the above procedures of handling complaints, all parties to the court proceedings may bring it up to the court if there is any allegation or concern that a fair trial may be undermined by the quality of the interpreter in the court proceedings. The court may deal with it on its own should any interpretation problem be noted. The matter concerned can also be raised on appeal as and when necessary. The court will handle the relevant allegations strictly in accordance with the law to ensure that a fair trial takes place. While the Judiciary Administration does not see an imminent need to enlarge its pool of sign language interpreters, it will from time to time take in new interpreters who meet the relevant requirements to ensure the sustainability of the sign language interpretation service. In this regard, the Judiciary Administration is considering the introduction of an enhanced mechanism whereby relevant professionals from local universities and veteran sign language interpreters with practical court experience may be invited to assess the proficiency of the candidates concerned. Thank you. Mr. Shukatran. 
the Chief Secretary has not answered my question. In the main reply, he mentioned that the Judiciary Administration has a, a register of 17 sign language interpreters. I just checked the register. I couldn't find this information online. I couldn't find the register at all. So, for the, so how come this register is so mysterious? Why is he uh, hidden? Now, it says here that uh, full-time court interpreters will collect feedback and views on the performance of interpreters. Now, for full-time court interpreters, they do not know sign language. How can they assess the performance of uh, sign language interpreters? This is only common sense. You don't even have it. So how can we discuss such a matter with the go Hong Kong government? As for the... Um, uh, Management of a sign language interpreters, you're, you're just trying to shirk responsibility. Now, if uh, sign language interpreters are not to be uh, managed by the uh, Judiciary Administration, how come the um, Judiciary Administration issues um, some form of uh, an endorsement of the sign language interpreters? So when there is a problem, then you will not regulate them. You're just trying to shirk your responsibility. So the Chief Secretary is not... is playing with, with words today, you're playing with logic. So maybe, um, you know, um, there's no no point asking you questions because we won't get anywhere. Chief Secretary, the register of the 17 sign language interpreters has not been loaded uh, onto the website. It's an um, internal matter. If uh, there's need to um, hire a sign language interpreter for a particular case, then um, someone would be drawn from the register. That's been the practice. But uh, uh, if you wish, we could uh, go back and uh, convey your 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 views to the judiciary administration. They will consider whether there is uh, is a need to upload the register online. But of course, that involves the question of privacy. Now. Um, you asked how full-time court interpreters may monitor the performance of sign language interpreters. It's not just full-time court interpreters. Uh, court in users are also involved. With, there are committees on court users. Uh, these are users representing uh, both the prosecution and the defense. So um, it's not just that uh, we have um, um, expert in um, or oral interpretation who wanted to the work of sign language interpreters, not just that. And as I said in my main reply, um, to ensure the sustainable sustainability of the service, there is a um, uh, plan, um, established mechanism, and if necessary, the system could be enhanced. Now, there are uh, experts and also seasoned um, uh, interpreters say, who have retired. We don't want to waste the talent, so we have both academics and practitioners together. And hopefully they could come up with an e a better um, assessment mechanism so we could keep improving quality of sign language interpretation service. Thank you. Dr. Fernando Jerome. Now, justice has to be served by the court, so it is uh, of utmost importance that there is accurate communication. For the hearing impaired, they ha have experienced a lot of difficulties with uh, communication. That's why sign language interpretation services is of utmost importance. Now, there was a rumor that um, a, there was a sign language interpreter who um, tried to persuade the defendant to plead guilty, and we don't want to see that. So we are very much concerned about the quality of sign language interpreters. As Mr. Xiu Ka Chung pointed out, your court interpreters do not know sign language interpretation, or do not know sign language at all. But here, but then in the main reply, it said that uh, the uh, court interpreters are responsible for assessing the performance of in, uh, sign language interpreters. But court interpreters do not know sign language, yet they are responsible for the for monitoring the performance of sign language interpreters. How do they do it? The chief secretary mentioned that um, um, scholars or seasoned uh, interpreters are, have been invited to assess proficiency, but that's about uh, the recruitment assessment. This is not about uh, monitoring the performance of sign language interpreters working at the court. So can you please give uh, us some um, um, proper reply? Now, if court interpreters do not 
know sign language, how do they monitor the performance of sign language interpreters? Chief Secretary. Now, uh, at court proceedings, there is a sign language interpreter, there's also a court interpreter, you know, providing oral interpretation. So it's not just sign language. So therefore, the court interpreter could observe the performance of the sign language interpreter colleague. Uh, the, 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 the court interpreter could, would be able to see that. So it's not just the court interpreter providing oral interpretation. Uh, there is also a court users committee i.e. the customers, so-called customers uh, of the court. Uh, and so they are also involved, so it's not just left to court interpreters alone. Now, as, uh, as I mentioned, um, there's going to be collaboration with the university. Hopefully then uh, by early next year, the enhanced um, scheme would be put in place. So it's about upgrading the uh, uh, performance level for the whole uh, so judiciary service. So that means then a better job could be done. Uh, which part of your question has not been answered? Well, I asked a specific and precise question. The court interpreters do not know sign language. How, therefore, do they monitor the performance of sign language interpreters? How do they come to any judgment as to whether the sign language interpreters are performing properly? Chief Secretary, well, as I said, uh, you know, court interpreters are not experts of sign language, they are experts of oral interpretation, but then we are talking about a monitoring system. There are other court users involved too, that's why it is an effective system. But if you want a more detailed discussion, I, I suggest that you refer it to the panel on administration of, of justice and legal services. Then we could uh, discuss ways to improve upon the arrangement. Mr. Kenneth Lau. What if uh, the witness or the defendant uh, replies to uh, questions uh, by sign language? So how uh, can you ensure that the verbatim record could fully reflect what the witness or the defendant has said? Now, if uh, the reply is given uh, through sign language, then the sign language interpreter uh, would have received a message and would the sign language interpreter then put that uh, reply in writing or is there a way to make sure that the verbatim record is 100% accurate? Well, the, during the court proceedings, if uh, there is a sign language interpreter, there will also be a court interpreter reading out the answer. You know, because I don't know sign language, you don't know sign language, so someone will actually read out the reply. And that's why, you know, how can we, um, you know, monitor it? It's exactly because uh, there will be, um, you know, two-way communication. That's why we're able to, to ensure quality. Mr. Portier. President, uh, from the Chief Secretary's reply, in the past five years, there have only been 100 cases a year. And there's just one complaint which has not been substantiated. So it seems that uh, the problem is not as serious as suggested. But then the Chief Secretary kept saying that there are users monitoring the performance of interpreters. I wonder if you've ever been in court uh, to see how proceedings are conducted. Now, let's not even talk about sign language interpretation, even if it's uh, just interpretation from um, you know, English to Cantonese or vice versa, then there are users who are able to see whether the interpretation is done properly. But if lawyers or counsels do not know sign language, there's no way they could monitor the quality of the sign language interpretation. So actually you're not giving any your, your answer is rather a non-answer in that sense. You're not explaining anything. So do you have figures to show that apart from sign language interpretation, what about uh, court interpretation for other languages? Are there any figures to show what the situation is like? Maybe this is an area of greater concern to the judiciary. Maybe uh, we're not talking about um, English interpretation. What about um, when there are South Asians or Africans involved in cases? What is the uh, amount of interpretation service provided for these other languages in a year? Chief Secretary, well, there are other foreign languages. For example, there are 37 um, uh, foreign languages, uh, French, uh, Russian, Spanish, and so on. Of course, we do not know them, so they have to hire um, special interpreters, and usually we will seek assistance from um, uh, the Consulate General, because there's good communication with communic Consulate General and the government. And then the 
the, there are dialects too, say, you know, Chiu Chao dialect, uh, Tai Shan, Tai Shan dialect. Again, we need to hire special interpreters. So there is a system to do that. Dr. Fernando Joe. Can you please uh, provide the information for our information, perhaps afterwards? Yes, we'll provide the figures after the meeting. But uh, I'm just saying that there are just about 100 cases uh, requiring sign language interpretation in a year. Ms. Dr. Fernando Jung. Now, courts, of course, will um, hire sign language interpreters on the register. The police force also uses the same uh, register for sign language interpreters. So uh, for both the law enforcement agencies and the courts, uh, they are using the same batch of the 17 sign language interpreters. That's why their quality matters. Now, um, Mr. Porchette said that in the main reply, the Chief Secretary said there's just one complaint over five years. But, you know, from my experience and Mr. Shu Kachu's experience, we've heard many complaints. And I thank Dr. Mr. Paul Chair for pointing out one thing. Now, the Trade Secretary referred to users, and these people could be could actually be the defendants. But then, for others present at in the court, they may not know sign language. So, uh, when say statements are taken at the police station or at courts when cases are heard, you know the, uh, there are no pe one who actually knows sign language. So, the, so the so-called uh, users are non-existent in that sense. So that's why my question is, how do you review the current uh, sign language interpretation system? There has to be a proper performance monitoring system, and there has to be continuous performance uh, assessments to make sure that uh, sign language interpretation service is fair, impartial, and professional. Chief Secretary. Dr. Fernando Jones referred to uh, the uh, uh, interpreters of the police force, uh, they, they, it's not the, from the same list of the court, it's different. You know, the, uh, the, you know, the Hong Kong Council of Social Service will provide a list of uh, sign language interpreters to the police. But uh, what is important is that um, if a sign language interpreter, say, has uh, been worked as an uh, interpreter in a particular case uh, at, at other stages, then during the court proceedings, the same interpreter will definitely not be hired. This is to avoid any possible conflict of interest. So if a, a, a sign language interpreter provides service at the a police station, then th 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 he will not be working at the court case. Dr. Jonathan Jern, which part of your question has not been answered? Well, my, I asked a specific question. How are you going to review the performance uh, monitoring system for sign language interpreters? Chief Secretary, any uh, uh, additional co comments? Well, as I said, we're going to review the uh, system uh, to enhance and enhance it. It's not just about at the recruitment stage. I understand uh, it's just a Chinese university. It's only a university that provides them um, such a training. So they have the expertise and they have the experience. And so uh, definitely they will uh, help to enhance the overall standard of uh, interpretive service for the judiciary, especially for sign language service. I'm very confident in that. Dr. Junius Ho. Well, I'd like to thank uh, the, uh, the concerns shown, but there are over 150,000 cases uh, to be dealt with in court at the magistracy. Actually, there are over 8, 380 cases. At the district court level, 40, 50,000 plus cases. High court, 40,000 cases. Court of appeal, a few thousand cases. And you're talking about sign language service. Is it really that important? Have you got the uh, priorities wrong? You know, there is a long delay in court cases. And we don't have enough people at all to deal with all these cases. And we are behind Singapore by 15 years with the electronic system. And you don't worry about all these uh, more important matters. And you care about uh, sign language interpretation. Service. How many witnesses actually need um, sign language interpreters? As uh, Paul Chair, Mr. Paul Chair mentioned, we don't even have enough court interpreters. And you are worried about sign language interpreters. Now, the... Uh, it says here the judiciary administration would uh, like to uh, bring in other 
um, resources. But I think that's not re this is not really the priority. There are many other more priorities. So, Chief Secretary, please make sure the judiciary administration will deal with the other priorities. We don't even have an electronic system. Give more resources to those SEC for sign language interpretation services. It's not that urgent. You should be bold enough to point that out. Thank you. Chief Secretary. Well, Dr. Ho's point is really valid, but it doesn't mean that we don't attach importance to or to other aspects. Uh, of course, uh, we need to um, boost the manpower of the judiciary. Uh, we need to, to have automation. So we need to um, try to com uh, follow the um, match the international standard. And there's uh, already a blueprint for all such enhancement. And uh, there is a piece of legislation, and once that's passed, then it will be easier for the task to be taken forward. So definitely, we're not going to discriminate. Uh, don't worry. Uh, priorities remain priorities. But then for uh, people with hearing impairment, we need to cater to their needs as well. So rest assured, we will be moving forward. Thank you. Honorable Wilson Orr. President, as reported that amid the shadows of the coronavirus disease 2019 epidemic, this year global demand for a seasonal influenza vaccine has increased drastically, resulting in a tight supply of the vaccine. On the other hand, there has been successive cases in Korea and Taiwan in which some residents felt unwell or died soon after receiving the shot, which are suspected to be related to the vaccines. One of the pharmaceutical companies involved is the major vaccine supplier of Hong Kong. Hong Kong people are their six and sevens as they are worried that no vaccine will be available for injection while they are concerned about the safety. In this connection, will the government inform this council what it has assessed the impact of the supply of vaccines to Hong Kong brought about by the successive cases in overseas places in which some people have been inoculated develop health problems of the plans in place to resolve the shortage of vaccines so as to ensure that both the public and public health care system have sufficient vaccines to meet the demand. 2. Of the measures in place to ensure the safety and the efficacy of the influenza vaccine supply to Hong Kong and to prevent defective vaccines from being imported into Hong Kong. 3. Of the details of the existing mechanism for conducting tests and random checks on the quality of imported vaccines, whether it will test the vaccine from different suppliers and conduct tests on the antigen content or animal testing so as to ensure that vaccines meet the quality and safety requirements. Secretary for Fruit and Health Madam Deputy, in consultation with the Department of Health, a consolidated reply to the various parts of the question raised by Honorable Wilson Orr is as follows. 1. In relation to early reports from certain overseas places of adverse reaction and death swallowing influenza vaccination, DH has liaised with the World Health Organization, WHO, concerned health authorities at the relevant places and the vaccine supplier. And noted that the relevant health authorities consider there was no evidence on safety concerns of relevant influenza vaccines. Health authorities at Korea and Taiwan have also announced investigation results of those incidents. Singapore and Malaysia, which had earlier suspended their relevant vaccination program due to this incident, have also resumed their vaccination programs. And the Department of Health also confirmed with the vaccine supplier that the influenza vaccine supply to Hong Kong was of a different batch. The DH will continue to closely monitor development and ensure the implementation of the vaccination program while maintaining the safety of the vaccines and the risk of vaccination at an acceptable level. For supply of vaccines under the vaccination program, the DH has procured a total of 878,000 doses of inactivated influenza vaccine for the 2020-21 season vaccination programs comprising 628,000 doses for the Gafwin Vaccination Program GVP and 250,000 doses for the Seasonal Influenza Vaccination School Outreach Free of Charge Primary School Scheme for eligible high-risk groups to receive influenza 
vaccination free of charge in phases. The vaccine suppliers have undertaken to ensure a steady supply of vaccines procured by the government. According to established practice, influence of vaccines for the vaccination subsidy scheme VSS and the seasonal influenza vaccination school outreach free of charge kindergartens, kindergartens, come child care centers, and child care centers will be procured by the participating doctors themselves. In view of the keen demand for seasonal flu vaccine by members of the public recently and its tight demand globally, the government announced on 22nd of October that it will procure additional vaccine as well as to provide an additional 100,000 doses of vaccine in phases to public-private partnership teams which provide vaccination for school children and doctors enrolled in VSS which require the vaccines. This facilitates the high-risk group to receive vaccination early and help relieve the tight supply in private health care sectors. The DH had early contacted more than 1,600 doctors who have enrolled in the 2021 Seasonal Influenza Vaccination School Outreach Free of Charge and the VSS on their demands for seasonal influenza vaccines and to inform them of the relevant arrangements. And separately, the Home Affairs Department will allocate additional flu vaccine to non-government organizations and district organization partnering with the healthcare facilities or doctors or clinics enrolled in ABSs across the 18 districts to provide flu vaccination for the public. The allocation exercise is currently underway and expected to be completed in December 2020. Regarding the vaccine supply in the local private healthcare sector, the DH have been closely in touch with the vaccine suppliers and noted arrival of a new batch of flu vaccine of around 85,000 doses in mid to late November to supply to the local uh, private healthcare sector. The DH will ensure a steady supply of seasonal influenza vaccines under of vaccination programs and closely relate with suppliers on the supply of vaccine to the local healthcare sector. Well, two and three, part of the question. Any product including vaccines for human use fall within definition of pharmaceutical product under the Pharmacy and Poison Ordinance Cap 138 must satisfy the criteria of safety, efficacy, and quality for registration with the Pharmacy and Poisons Board of Hong Kong before they can be sold or distributed in Hong Kong. For manufacturers of pharmaceutical products, the most important effective way is to ensure the quality and safety of the product is to strictly comply with the Good Manufacturing Practices GMP for medicines. Manufacturers of locally manufactured and imported pharmaceutical products have to comply with the requirements of GMP under the Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme PICS. PICS. The ordinance also stipulates that only licensed manufacturers or wholesale dealers can carry on business as an importer exporter of pharmaceutical products. Licensed manufacturer could only import pharmaceutical products for its own manufacturing or export its own manufactured products. Import export of pharmaceutical products are subjected to control under the Import Export Ordinance Cap 60. Licensed wholesale dealers are required to apply for the import or export license for each import export shipment of pharmaceutical products, including vaccines for the DH. With regard to quality assurance, according to WHO guidelines on regulatory preparedness for provision of marketing authorization of human pandemic flu vaccine for non vaccine producing countries, the procured vaccine should be produced in compliance with the GMP test for quality and safety by the vaccine manufacturer and went through the procedure for quality control testing and released by the responsible national control laboratory in accordance with the WHO guidelines for independent lot release of vaccines by regulatory authorities. The DH normal does not conduct 
sampling checks on pharmaceutical products, including vaccines, at the time of import to avoid delaying the import to and supply to the local market. On the other hand, the DH has in place a regular market surveillance mechanism to collect samples of both locally manufactured and imported pharmaceutical products, including vaccines from suppliers and a market for analysis. The sampling strategy is based on a risk assessment of the information collected from overseas drug regulatory authorities, rapid alert mechanism of picks or complaints or inquiries made by local suppliers for healthcare professionals. Thank you, President. Mr. Wozenor. Thank you, Deputy. In the main reply, the Secretary have stated the government measures to ensure the adequate and secure supply of vaccines and assure the public not to worry. I want to tell the secretary that this time we're lucky that uh, nothing quite happened with the imported vaccines. However, one accident is too many. And in front of us, that under the COVID-19 pandemic, the demand for flu vaccine is tight. It's difficult to look for a flu shot. The public is most concerned about Besides the tight supply and also cared about the safety of the vaccines, I know the Secretary has stated the government have altogether uh, bought uh, 960,000 vaccines to meet the total demand. I know the Secretary is quite clear. In the 2018 defective flu vaccine incident, it exposed the government uh, only conduct uh, visual checks but failed to get tested. The government claimed they will monitor the situation. May I ask the administration how we conduct uh, sampling uh, lab checks for acceptance or adopt the old mechanism in ensuring vaccine safety? Secretary, and for the safety and the quality and the efficacy of vaccine, the DH have always put it in top priority for the under the establishment mechanism that before registering this from to product that the whole manufacturing procedure must follow the GMP guidelines and before its manufacturing before the manufacturer uh, uh, to conduct as quality uh, control testing before mass manufacturing and before being released to the market they also need to conduct uh, sampling checks and for the vaccine manufacturers the uh, exported country we have the mechanism and testing in place and also following WH guide, oh, guidelines in releasing the, them to the market so we uh, keep this in view if otherwise there would no way they can be registered in Hong Kong and also after it be arrived in Hong Kong for example uh, we shall work with the PICS on our alert mechanism and locally we have the local ma market surveillance mechanism for any adverse reaction to vaccine or pharmaceutical products the DH will gather information for risk assessment then it will consider uh, to uh, test these kind of products Thank you, Deputy. Dr. Chang, what point of order? May I ask if the Hong Kong government and the NPCSC have announcement on the eligibility of legislators and they always make a decision. Since it involves logical affairs, I see that the Madam Deputy should exercise your powers to adjourn the meeting to deal with logical affairs. As for your point of order, I'll ask the secretary to obtain the information. And it's also an um, important decision. I will uh, consider your opinion. And I suppose we can deal with this question. And I will make an announcement in due course.
Uh, how are you? And dear members, as the government have uh, issued me a correspondence also announced for me by N the People's People Congress. I shall adjourn the meeting to deal with such matters.